behalf of Indian Rheumatology Association, I welcome you all to our web meeting, which is an innovation in reference to the challenge of coronavirus. And as you all appreciate, we have started feeling and started appreciating that we are living with this coronavirus. We have to live with this coronavirus. The things should move. And we have planned from IRA Forum a mixed pack of national and international luminaries on rheumatology. And the first segment is rheumatoid arthritis. We had yesterday a very exciting program. And today we are having the second part of it. So I, I can assure you that you would enjoy the whole sessions with all the contributions on the, from the faculties and you would get enough of time for interaction. And through this interaction, we can enrich our wisdom and so that we can translate the concept from bedside to bedside in clinical practice. Thank you very much. Let's enjoy. And now to moderator, Dr. Rath and Dr. Chandra Shekhar to initiate the program. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So all of you, welcome to this webinar. And uh, we have a very interesting session lined up, some very fantastic speakers and some very good topics. Going ahead with our first uh, session and our first speaker and our first topic. Now, all of you know that disease, uh, you know, the rheumatoid arthritis today, we need to control the disease very tightly. And to control the disease tightly, we need to first assess the disease. So on a, one hand, we have all these various outcome measures with us. But on the other hand, in our country, there are people who are looking at 80 to 100 patients a day. So how practical is it? Is it, is it really practical in our setup to do this? And for that, we have a very eminent speaker. And it's not only my privilege, but my honor to introduce Professor Roini Handa, former professor at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, currently senior consultant rheumatologist at the Apollo Hospital in the Prast, Delhi. Professor Handa, as all of you know, I don't need to introduce him to you. He's been the past president of the Delhi Rheumatology Association, the past president of the Indian Rheumatology Association, and the past president of the Asia Pacific League Against Rheumatism. More than 350 publications to his credit, and many an awards uh, to name a few, I would say PN Berry Award, the IRA Oration, uh, the Shakuntala Mirchand uh, ICMR prizes, and it, the list goes endless. But I think one of the best and the finest orators that we've had and we will ever have in, in this country, I would like to hand over to Professor Rueni Handa, sir, please. Thank you very much for the rather generous introduction, PD. Friends and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President, it's my privilege to start the proceedings today. And I've been assigned the task of speaking on disease assessment in rheumatoid arthritis. I have no disclosures pertaining to this presentation. Now, rheumatoid has the distinction of being the commonest inflammatory polyarthritis that we encounter in clinical practice. It is by no means the commonest joint disease that one comes across in the community. That distinction belongs to osteoarthritis. But in terms of inflammatory polyarthritis, it tops the list. Now, there have been three game-changing concepts in rheumatoid arthritis over the last few years. And I call them the T's of rheumatoid arthritis. Time to treat is the first concept. Rheumatoid is a time critical illness. Time translates into cartilage. So you institute treatment early and early treatment fetches you the best dividends. There is one caveat. In our country, patients will continue to present late, and it is never too late to treat rheumatoid arthritis, although earlier the better. The second game-changing concept has been the advent of targeted treatments, and it is these biologics and the JAK inhibitors now which have catapulted rheumatology to fame to the center stage of all excitement in the biomedical world, and the last but not the least, the third game-changing concept has been treating to target. And this is what we are going to discuss today. Now, we have moved over from experience. 
eminence and eloquence to evidence. Rheumatoid arthritis is no exception. Subjective impressions about disease activity have made way for objective measurements, and this is called metrology. Metrology is so very different from meteorology, which is the science which deals with whether what we are talking about today is metrology. Now, this slide has a listing of different days that are commemorated in the rheumatology community. So well familiar to all of us. We have the World Arthritis Day. We have the World Lupus Day. Not to be left behind, we have the Rheumatoid Arthritis Awareness Day. And so do we have the World Osteoporosis Day and we have several others. But few of us talk about 20th of May. And the 20th of May is the day when the scientific community, cutting across disciplines, observes the word metrology day. And metrology is what we are going to discuss today. Metrology as applied to the discipline of rheumatology in the disease that is rheumatoid arthritis. And this is the logo of the Bureau of International Measures in Paris. This is the organization of uh, metrology. And this is what we indeed need to popularize amongst the practicing clinicians. Rheumatoid arthritis is a multi-dimensional disease. We have different facets, disease activity, disease disability, structural damage, and at the center stage of which is the quality of life. And we have tools to measure these different domains. For the non-initiated, this is an analogy that I often like to give. For the non-rheumatologists in the audience, we talk about activity, disability, and damage in rheumatoid arthritis, and these are the validated tools to measure it. The time on a dash 28, the health assessment questionnaire, and the presence or absence of erosions and joint space narrowing on plain radiographs. And if I extrapolate the concept to diabetes, this is what we as physicians have been doing all along. We have fasting and postprandial sugars, which give you a cross-sectional snapshot of glycemic control. The three-month assessment, we have glycated hemoglobin, and we assess organ damage, the well-known neuropathy, nephropathy, and retinopathy by clinical assessment. Much in the same way, akin to diabetes, we have different facets of the disease in rheumatoid arthritis. And what I'm going to discuss today is mainly disease activity, but this is not to take away from the importance of the other domains of rheumatoid arthritis, which I have spelled here. And this is a slide which lists the different domains you have different validated tools. Disease damage, you have radiographs, you have ultrasound, and you have MRs. Disability, mainly assessed based on questionnaires, and you have several of them. And you have those validated by the Center for Rheumatic Diseases in Pune and by Dr. Ashok Kumar at the All India Institute. So you do have the Indian versions of HACC also, and then you have for quality of life, a variety of measures which are generic, disease specific. And it is not my brief to go into the details of all of these. And I shall confine myself to disease activity in rheumatoid arthritis. Now, there are several variables that are employed to assess disease activity. These could be simple joint counts. This could be the NSA pill count. This could be the duration of morning stiffness, patient dissatisfaction, 50 feet walk time, grip strength. But what you need to, I think, emphasize is that we have individual measures on one hand and the pooled indices on the other hand. Single measures, individual measures, 
are unable to capture all facets of the multidimensional disease it is a statistical nightmare to get meaningful information which is why we now have the application of composite scores which allow for better consistency and application increase statistical power reduce sample size requirements they do have a drawback that they cannot be broken down into individual components but in modern day management we talk about composite scores and this is something which has evolved over a period of time the second cardinal concept is status measures versus response measures now rheumatoid is a disease in continuum so what you have are snapshots cross sectional snapshots of the disease activity when the patient is sitting in front of you that's called a status measure or a process measure and this is more applicable to individual than in the clinic and examples are the dash scores the cdi the sdi and remission that daniel elitaha shall talk about later in the evening in contradistinction response measures or outcome measures assess the changes in disease activity over a period of time and you have the well known acr 20 50 and 70 criteria unfortunately they assess improvement they do not capture worsening and they are applicable more to groups at the group level in the clinic at the bedside you can't apply acr 20 to the individual patient and this fundamental distinction is important so what you and i apply in everyday practice at the bedside are status measures or process measures and i have listed some of them and you can also apply these status measures to look at response and i shall not dwell upon that because of lack of time now this is a recent publication by the american college of rheumatology and this is a crowded slide and this should not put you off at the last count a slew of measures to assess disease activity in rheumatoid arthritis 47 when they counted it last imaging measures the health provider measures laboratory measures and we have the patient related outcome measures so you have a slew of measures but if you look at practically applicable measures they talk about five and this is what you and i do in everyday practice disease activity score the cdi the sdi and we have rapid 3 and the patient activity scale 2 this is a recent publication that looks at the patient related outcome measures so very important in the modern day context when the patient and the healthcare provider are at an equal pedestal and have to have shared decision making and this is an area of fertile research this is the health measures also known as the person centered mind you you don't call it patient centered person centered assessment resource from the nih in which you have the promise tool the neuro quality of life and other uh, measures all of which put patient at the center stage and these are patient related outcome measures and i shall dwell upon them a little while later this is an example of rapid 3 applicable to patients with rheumatoid arthritis propagated by ted pinkers you look at three questions and these questions deal with physical function pain patient global assessment scored 0 through 10 and this is the score you get max of 30 higher scores indicate a poorer status and this is routinely advocated and applied and then we have the patient activity scale 2 and this is fred wool who propagated these and these two are rapidly employed uh, they are quick to administer while the patient is waiting unfortunately in our country where education at times is an impediment these uh, health assessment questionnaires and the patient related outcome measures may have some problems you do not have validated translations available the lady will often look to her husband she is afraid that she may score something wrong 
but in the western world these are employed on a widespread basis and they are as effective in measuring disease activity as the physician derived outcome measures a quick take on the joint counts this is the mannequin showing the traditional acr joint count 68 tender joints 66 swollen joints the hips are excluded in the swelling and these have made way for the simplified abbreviated truncated 28 joint count just because it's in a busy opd too time consuming and cumbersome to count 66 joints and this is the reason why you have a 28 joint count but it doesn't take away from the clinical importance of the small joint of the feet and this is the well known formula that you and i have been applying dash 28 score and then you get the cutoffs uh, 2.6 3.2 5.1 and this requires a formula and you have calculators that are widely available and the subsequent additions of disease activity assessment have looked at simplified disease activity index simple numerical summation of the joint counts crp patient and physician global assessment and cdi which is totally clinically orientated and professor smolens group including daniel ali taha have been at the forefront of research in this and these are the cutoffs that are employed cutoffs for remission low disease activity moderate disease activity high disease activity and you as rheumatologists we now know that we don't wait endlessly we need to get the patient into remission that's the target failing which low disease activity and 80 percent of that should come in about three months so rheumatologists are physicians in a hurry now there has been a trend to move away from das to cdi and sdi and this has been driven by the fact that professor smolan and his group have been highlighting this fact tender joint has double the weight of swollen joint in das 28 and people who are in das 28 remission may have several swollen joints and they have also emphasized the differential effect of therapies like IL-6 inhibitors on CRP, ESR. So if you look at trials with IL-6, what you have is a patient who's on DAS-28 remission, yet the ACR-70 response is lower. Now, this is counterintuitive. How can a patient in remission still continue to have a ACR-70, which is lower than remission? And this is to do with the fact that the IL-6 inhibitor lowers ESR and CRP and the patients may still be left with a swollen joints. And if you look at JAK inhibitors, they lower CRP more than they lower the ESR and which is why you have this oddity happening with tocilizumab. And this is the reason why there has been a slow but subtle shift from DAS-28 to the CDI and STIs. Now, this is the last five minutes of my talk and two quotations by Thomas More. One of the greatest problems of our time is that many are schooled, but few are educated. The second quotation is, nobody owns anything, but everyone is rich. For what greater wealth can be there than cheerfulness, peace of mind, and freedom from anxiety? And Sir Thomas More, was the first person who coined the term utopia. Latin 1516, translated into English in 1551. And this is the task assigned to me. This photograph is not very flattering. Looks like a prison mugshot. But if you look at what I was told to do, utopia versus real life. And this is what I intend to address in the next about four minutes. Now, when I looked at the topic, I thought they've spelt it wrongly. And when I dug deep in, what I found was utopia is an obsolete word. You have white, you have black, and then you have shades of gray. 
utopia, dystopia, utopia. Utopia is a functional place. As I quoted Thomas More, a place where everybody is happy, no evil. Utopia is a good place, can happen. And dystopia is a bad place. And this is what I have paraphrased. Fictionalized idealism, which I would say is Satyog. Utopia, pragmatic realism, which is Ram Rajya. And then you have real life functioning anarchy that is Kalyug for you. And let us look at this in the context of rheumatoid arthritis. What about disease assessment in real life? Three impediments come up. Clinical inertia. Many busy clinicians with workflow difficulties will just eyeball the patient and make a global assessment. Is the disease quiet? Is it active? And this eyeballing is very rampant, no matter what we say, what we do. And then, of course, we have the patient preference. And this is the only trial that I'm going to present, traction trial. The acronym is almost a tongue twister. I won't go into the detail, but I draw your attention to what these uh, investigators found out that patient preference and out of 90 patients, one third of the patients had uh, inhibitions in increasing their treatment in response to increased disease activity. And physicians on their part found that the disease activity measure was unrelated to rheumatoid arthritis. And this is what was elegantly put forward by Frederick Poole, that RA patients may have a discordance between what they perceive as activity and the physician. And this is the bottleneck in real life. When you tell a patient that your disease is active, the patient says, Doc, I'm doing fine. I think I can stay without increasing medication. And your disease activity measures also may reflect a discordance between your patient perception and what the measure shows. And that is why many people these are the impediments to application in practice and many experienced clinicians eyeball and treat. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to transition from utopia to utopia. Objective measurements are indeed superior to subjective impressions. They improve outcomes. No two words about that. We need to improve the uptake of this in routine clinical practice. The universal implementation is lacking for the reasons that I have outlined, and we need to work on all fronts. We need better measurement tools, and we need physician sensitization and patient education. The science of metrology has now transitioned from being a research instrument to an indispensable bedside tool. Look before you leap, measure before you treat in the disease that is rheumatoid arthritis. Thank you very much for your kind attention and I'll be happy to take up questions. Thank you, sir. That was wonderful, as always, very simplistic overview of such a, such a difficult topic in our country. Uh, so I think what, what we have clearly understood is that the way to go ahead is to measure before you treat, as sir says. But what kind of measurement is very important because it's very important that you use the same kind of measurement in your practice and you can choose from a wide gamut of them. And as he has shown, there are pros and cons with each, each of them. And yeah, like mentioned again involve clinical assessments, radiological ass assessments and so on and so forth. So, sir, uh, we have uh, people asking, so people are, as it is very much moved by your talk and we have questions and let me start with the simplistic question by Dr. Arindam. He is asking from Hyderabad, sir, which is the one which you you would use or you usually use in your practice? What which assessment do you? I use, use the uh, clinical disease activity index, and I'm quite comfortable with DAS because you have calculators available. But I use CDI, and also when I'm hard pressed for time, eyeballing. I would be less than truthful if I said that if I am racing against time, that I eyeball and look at a holistic uh, thing. By and large, I try to look at the joint counts and use CDA. Right, sir, because mm -hmm. Dr. Prashant is asking because the DAS-28, the problem with DAS-28 is he says that, you know, the ankles and the lower limb gets uh, ignored. 
what would you say about that? I mean, no, they are also ignored in the CDI and the SDI because the joint counts don't change with the method. And I have told you that the influential group from Vienna have has shifted the paradigm towards CDI and SDI. And this is because the trial data showed that when you were using IL-6 inhibitors, you get impressive DASH-28 results, but less than impressive CDIs and SDIs. And I've showed you the results with JAK inhibitors, and that is why. The joint counts are no different. And I also notice a question on NSAIDs and can you use it as a disease activity assessment? Well, this NSAID pill count was the time-honored thing. It's no longer employed now because in a well-controlled patient, you seldom, if ever, use NSAIDs. Absolutely. Uh, right. The advantage of CDI also is that, you know, it does away with the lab measurements like the ESR and CRP, which I think in our country is very dubious, you know. So many different labs and every time the patient comes from a different lab, a different report, and somebody sometimes it is an HSCRP, sometimes it is a CRP. So I think it really makes CDI a very, very good uh, assessment absolutely. for our country. So Kunal, Dr. Kunal has been asking a lot of questions. I must congratulate him since yesterday he's very active. He's asking about uh, whether there's a simplistic radiological score which we could use bedside for I assessment. I can't really say there are several available and the IRA has done a lot of workshops with Dr. Shankar, Dr. Vinod Ramvindran and outside of a research setting, what you look at is you look at joint space narrowing, you look at erosions and you look at soft tissue swelling and I have not done formal uh, radiologic scoring in routine clinical practice ever. And with the current classification criteria for rheumatoid doing away with x-rays, in 1987, when the American College of Rheumatology criteria came up, erosions were a part of that. Every single person was subjected to hand x-rays, but now you see they have removed this because erosions come up late. I can't really give you the answer on the time taken to score, but we do have uh, several methods, modifications available, and maybe people who have worked on it can give you a time taken to score. Uh, do you count carpal crowding as erosion? Well, good question. Carpal crowding is more reflector of cartilage loss than anything. Ultrasound in assessing disease activity, yes, it's employed. I think PD is the person to answer this. I mean, he does ultrasound. Yeah, I, I think ultrasound, again, as uh, I think, uh, as has been shown that most of the ultrasound studies have shown that if you do a clinical assessment, uh, it's as good as doing a radiological assessment. It does, radiological assessment has still now not proven in trials to be superior to clinical assessment. It's almost the same information, but yes, there are multiple ultrasound studies. Uh, well, uh, so you can use anything, I use sonar group scoring. So it is important that you adapt a particular score it doesn't matter which score, but as long as you're able to replicate that time and again, that is more important. Uh, sir, we have another question about RAPIDS-3. Uh, how do you place it in your assessment? I don't choose it because one, it is not translated into Hindi. And I find that the woman often looks at her husband, she is hesitant. And when you apply these questionnaires, whether it is quality of life and we've applied sleep questionnaires, we've applied quality of life questionnaires, you need them to be translated, back translated, validated, and you just can't give a thing which is in English to a person to apply. So I actually don't use them because what I find is that the people who come and meet us, the educational and the socioeconomic background is very different. But having said that, we've uh, tried it with sleep studies and we've tried it with quality of life questionnaires. There are some challenges. And I prefer to use CDI. Very true. I absolutely agree because we did a study in Max with more than 200 patients with rapid three, and that was purely in English. We could not translate because there was no validated translation. And what we found is people overscore on rapid three because of comorbidities like fibromyalgia and osteo. So that really doesn't give a good assessment of the right disease. Activity. Thank you, sir. Uh, so the next question, sir, is: uh, Is there any, any need to include hip joint and TMJ joint in assessment by Dr. Ashish Saha? You see, the inclusion in a joint count does not take away from the clinical importance of that joint. Please remember one thing, if you have ankle arthritis, even if you don't score it in DASH-28, it will impact the quality of life of the patient 
and the ACR is very clear that you know if you have a clinically involved joint, it must be recorded in the case notes. Dash 28 is means to an end. The 28 joint count is means to an end, not an end in itself. So TM joint, if it is not scored, doesn't take away from the value of that. I think a very interesting question being being asked by Dr. Mahesh. He says, why is non non arthritic manifestations ignored in all the measures? No, I think basically it's to do with the fact that you, in a multidimensional disease, you look at direct me measures. You do not look at everything conceivable because it would become unwieldy and blunderbuss. The best is the enemy of good. So you try adopting the best and you will forsake the good. And this is what happens when you saw in the traction trial data. So if you try to include the impact of anemia, the impact of as Professor Malvia yesterday talked about the tip of iceberg, if you talk about coronary artery symptoms, if you talk about quality of life, if you talk about sleep, if you talk about sexual health, then you would require to sit one day with the patient and the best is the enemy of the good. So let's settle for good and not aim for the best. I think we just have enough time for the last one or two questions. Dr. Kriti Kishore is asking, in patients with clinical remission, but serological activity, would you like to escalate therapy? Absolutely not. This phenomena of clinical serologic discordance and clinical radiologic discordance in rheumatology has a straight answer. Don't chase the serology, don't chase the radiology, treat the patient. Uh, watchful waiting is what you do and you escalate only when the patient has things and this happens all the while in conditions like vasculitides, uh, conditions like lupus where you have DSDNA levels which continue to be very high in rheumatoid because we don't order RF and ACPAs that very often we may find that we don't really track them but the dictum is simple the rule of the thumb is treat the patient don't chase the serology. Thank you sir I'll just end with the final question very very interesting from Dr. Ankur Dalal in the present COVID scenario how do we assess disease activity? How do we assess the disease activity in the present COVID scenario. Oh, you ask the patient to then on a mannequin score the joints. Tell him that I am going to send you a mannequin by WhatsApp. Aap uspe nishan laga dijiye. And then whatever, that's what you try to do. And you say uh, what is called the patient global assessment. Rupai mein kitne paise takleef hai. And the youngsters don't get this. Rupai mein kitne paise aur kitna aana. So you ask them that, you know, what percentage. Because, you know, I straddle two generations, so the youngsters don't understand this rupai mein kitne paise, they don't have, they've never seen paisa. So you ask them the percentage and you get an answer. Even an illiterate person would be able to tell you that I'm 50% better, 70% better. So this is called eyeballing by the patient and eyeballing by the rheumatologist. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you so much sir, for enlightening us. We'll move on to the next talk. I'll request my moderator. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rath and uh, Dr. Rohini Handa. I think uh, one of the major challenges that what we are now working is, we all now know we need to treat rheumatoid arthritis early. So the question that comes is, how early is early? So is it a, something which I start as soon as a patient comes with the first symptom? or should I start treating the patient as soon as he figures out with some serological marker, or should I chase to figure out and find a patient very early in the course of the disease, much before he manifests or comes with a full-fledged uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Mm -hmm. To address this, I think today we have uh, Dr. Damodaran, who uh, practices in uh, Tirupati. Uh, he has a nice, good rheumatology setup, uh, Shubodaya Rheumatology Center. He is practicing in Tirupati after completing his DM uh, in rheumatology from Nizams in 2012. And uh, without much time, I uh, hand over the uh, uh, same to uh, Dr. Damodaran. Please go ahead. Thank you, sir, for your kind introduction. Uh, and I would like to thank the IRA uh, members uh, for giving this opportunity. And coming to my topic, uh, this is uh, preclinical uh, pre uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, two month jail for the new. So, <clears throat> uh, we have uh, uh, coming to the introduction the autoimmune rheumatic diseases uh, accounts for nearly 5% of the total population. Uh, 
and most of the times in your uh, routine clinical setting at presentation they present with the chronic disease so when they present with the chronic disease they have got a substantial morbidity mortality and uh, because the chronic disease and because of the advent of uh, newer agents it adds to the high financial cost and thus uh, there is a huge scope for ARDS prevention which can uh, markedly improve the public health and it is a very good window of opportunity uh, when it comes to the uh, uh, real life scenarios. So this is uh, the evolution of uh, rheumatoid. So it has got a different phase, uh, preclinical rheumatoid, then followed by an, a phase of arthralgia, then a phase of uh, undifferentiated arthritis and then a frank rheumatoid arthritis. So the studies have shown that the antibodies are uh, detected uh, 10 to 20 years before the onset of uh, joint pain. And once the patient develops arthralgia, some studies have shown that the increased levels of interleukin-8 can stimulate uh, arthralgia-like syndromes, like pains. And this is one of the cytokine important in the genesis of the pain uh, mechanisms. And these phase, uh, once there is a development of arthralgia, then the progression to undifferentiated arthritis and then progression to arthritis is very fast. So the arthralgia can go into a, a very early rheumatoid arthritis where we call it as, uh, some people will remain, uh, as a, uh, remain as it is, some people progress to rheumatoid. And uh, those patients who has got uh, persistent inflammatory uh, symmetrical joint pains, this is called PISA. So these are the subgroup of people uh, which are high risk for uh, developing into rheumatoid arthritis. So when we speak of uh, preclinical rheumatoid arthritis, it is that phase of the disease before any joint symptoms. So we don't have uh, any uh, modality uh, except genetic markers or serological markers or the estimation of the cytokine levels in the blood to diagnose preclinical RE. So this is the epidemiology of preclinical rheumatoid arthritis. In a study where they followed prospectively uh, 2,700 patients, uh, every uh, once in two years. So they noted 70 new cases of rheumatoid arthritis after nine years, 19 years. This is almost like one to two percent of uh, incidence. So this is the same incidence we notice in the general population. And what they found was uh, progressively higher titers of rheumatoid factor uh, leads to uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So, and the retrospective studies incorporating the blood bank repositories. So they found those blood donors who developed rheumatoid arthritis, they have these autoantibodies, both the rheumatoid factor and anti-CCP antibodies uh, 10 years before and cytokines uh, was noted uh, three to four years before the onset of the rheumatoid arthritis. So this clearly indicates that there is a preclinical expansion and amplification of disease-specific autoantibodies and inflammation and joint damage. So when there is uh, in the preclinical rheumatoid, is there any asymptomatic synovial inflammation? So that's the biggest, big, big question. So the answer is no. So when the patient doesn't have any joint pains, it, does, it, it means that patient doesn't have any, uh, symptom, any uh, asymptomatic synovial inflammation. So these are the uh, four studies uh, that was uh, uh, exclusively explored whether there is any uh, uh, asymptomatic synovial inflammation by using MRI and by using immunohistochemical studies of synovial tissue, and therefore that there are neither the inflammatory cells, nor there are the blood vessels that are associated with the development of arthritis, and MRI showed no indication of synovial inflammation even weeks and months before, to the, before the clinical onset of the, onset of the disease. This, this clearly mentions there is no role for MRI, and there is no role for ultrasound in preclinical rheumatoid arthritis. So when their joints are ex, uh, perfectly normal, so then where is the uh, inflammation is going on? So the inflammation is going on in the lymph nodes, in the periodontal tissues, in the lungs, and in the gastrointestinal system. In the lymph nodes, some people have observed that they have the, uh, the, the earliest abnormality that was noted is the lack of the contractility of the uh, lymphatic capillaries. And there is a increased immune cell activation and there is a reduced circulating and lymph node CD4 pass to IL-10 pass to T cells. And there is increase in peripheral uh, TH17 group of cells. And similarly, in the periodontal tissue, uh, 
these anti leukotoxin a antibodies they are directly correlated with the anti ccp antibodies in the blood and these leukotoxin a is produced by the p gingivalis and there are a lot of uh, post translational uh, modifications occurring on the igg part of acpa there is reduced uh, terminal galactosylation by prevetella species aberrant glycosylation of igg these all a uh, post translation modification which enhance the uh, capacity of acpa to induce disease and uh, these uh, p gingivalis produce specific substance called gingipanes and this induces a strong netosis and netosis is also one of the rich source for citrulline and these circulating nets correlated with the periodontal severity and nicotine administration increases netosis netosis directly by uh, and acetylcholine receptors in the lung you can see lung dysbiosis there is increased speech evidence of uh, various infectious organisms before the development of rheumatoid and they are rich in acps in the uh, uh, preclinical ra group for about to develop rheumatoid and we can see in lot of studies there are a lot of airway abnormalities that are associated with uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis and acpa to fib uh, uh, fibrinogen and uh, apoe and fibronectin was detected in the lung tissues in preclinical rheumatoid arthritis similarly in the gastrointestinal system there are uh, studies which shows that there are citrullated vimentin was found in the colonic mucosa plenty in preclinical rheumatoid arthritis there is a gut dysbiosis altered uh, microbiome and they have a peculiar phenomenon called gut leak syndrome so this gut leak syndrome can induce autoimmunity and cytokine imbalance and some studies has found found that any history of previous appendicectomy so these people are more prone for rheumatoid basically by the mechanism of altering uh, uh, gut microbiome so if you see all these phases lymph node lungs peritoneal tissue and gat so the one the common axis that is linking is th17 axis so this clearly indicates that in the preclinical rheumatoid th17 axis is working uh, is a main culprit uh, cell leading to the uh, pathogenesis of uh, rheumatoid arthritis in the preclinical phase so then how you classify preclinical rheumatoid so eulor has defined various categories category a b c d e and f and this a b c d so this is the group where we can we can call them as preclinical rheumatoid those who has got a first degree relatives with genetic risk factors who are exposed to significant enrolled risk factors and systemic autoimmunity associated with rheumatoid and symptoms with third clinical so these four categories are included in preclinical rheumatoid this is for the purpose of doing research so there are a lot of genetic factors the largest effect side was noted with hla drb1 even though the pad 14 enzyme generates citrullinated antigens so naturally we think that this uh, this gene polymorphisms is associated with uh, rheumatoid but in real life scenario the effect size of this endogenous pad 14 pad 4 enzymes is very less so that indicates there is a environmental a uh, playing uh, environmental mediated pad citrullation is more important in the pathogenesis of rheumatoid arthritis and you can see there are a lot of factors that can induce citrullation in the from the environment side like smoking infection uh, peritoneal disease etc so this hla dr beyond shared deptop is not exclusive to rheumatoid arthritis this is seen in various auto Uh, immune disease like lupus ibd multiple sclerosis type 1 diabetes so the preclinical rheumatoid is not a small entity it is a very big entity so we can call it as preclinical autoimmunity but however the hla br dr b1 rheumatoid is specifically associated with k or a a shared epitope or q or a a but with the same epitope found in the other autoimmunities is the matter of research and how this shared epitope induces uh rheumatoid it leads to severe oxidative stress so this oxidative stress leads to protein and dna damage epigenetic mod modification telomere attrition premature cell senescence t cell hyporesponsiveness and the same mechanism has been implicated in atherosclerosis and also bone erosion so these uh, telomere attrition cell senescence may, may will make a lot of uh, different types of phenotype of uh, group of cells if you take cd4 cells there the uh, the there the entire uh, uh, immunometabolics is channeled to the uh, towards anabolic pathway 
But if you take uh, macrophages and uh, uh, FLS, fibroblast like cyanobacides, there it takes the catabolic pathway. So here it is independently apoptotic resistant uh, uh, T cells and on another side, uh, catabolically active uh, uh, active uh, macrophages and fibrins just by uh, in the in the in helper T cells the glycolytic pathway was uh, hampered whereas in the, in the other in the other macrophages this glycolytic pathway is facilitated so these all the glucose is shunted to the pentose phosphate pathway metabolism and generation of uh, uh, produ production of newer helper T cells whereas on the other side it is more of a catabolism so the preclinical rheumatoid is a significant cardiovascular risk factors. The studies have shown that this ACPA, even in the absence of rheumatoid arthritis, is associated with the cardiovascular disease, impaired left ventricular strain, a left ventricular relaxation, and lower left ventricular mass. This is the positive predictive value of ACPA in different settings. The population-wide prevalence of ACPA is 1 to 2 percent. So if you want to detect one rheumatoid, you need to detect uh, test 1200 patients. So this subgroup, if you follow uh, over the spin of time, a, only 8.5% of this 1-2% develop rheumatoid. Whereas if you further narrow down by a definition called, called clinically suspected arthralgia, the prevalence of ACP is increased and the number needed to test is de definitely reduced to 1 into 10. That this subgroup, 63% of patients develop rheumatoid in one year follow-up. So these are the citrulline agent epitope spreading, citrulline agent fibrinogen and pimentin was noted in the early autoantibodies in RA patients, followed by citrulinated enolase and filagrin, developed closer to disease onset, and citrulinated collagen is most prominently noted after the onset of clinical rheumatoid. Well, we have got so many animal models. These animal models are predominantly on the uh, antibodies to collagen. We don't have an ACPA model uh, to study the uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis as such. So that is one of the uh, significant impediment in the doing a mouse experiments. And you can see the citrullinated fibrinogen, we can see in periodontal diseases, and then citrullinated enolase, we can see periodontal disease. So the periodontal disease can be an initiator of the autoimmunity, and also it enhances the transition from category C to category D. That means the cytokines to the arthralgia phase has the capacity because why this is important is we have done a study in Nizam's Institute of Medical Sciences. We found that the periodontal disease is significantly higher in non smoking treatment naive rheumatoid arthritis patients. When you look into the uh, cohort, so the actual number of smokers are very, very less. So if you keep on uh, talking smoking, smoking, so we are neglecting periodontal disease. So in the real life scenario, this periodontal disease is very, very important in the genesis of rheumatoid arthritis. And then smoking can also uh, induce uh, a rheumatoid through the periodontal disease because you can see the periodontal disease incidence is much, much higher in smoking smokers. So these are the different autoantibodies in preclinical rheumatoid. RF, ACPA, ANA, anti pad 4 anti carbaminate protein. So we have much information about anti carp antibodies, but they don't have much use because of lower sensitivity uh, and they, they doesn't have any predictive power in zero negative patients. So there's no much additional role uh, when compared to the ACPAs, which is routinely available. Then type 1 sig interference signature. So this signature is correlated with rheumatoid arthritis development independent of the autoantibody status. There are seven subgroup of type 1 interferon genes. And if you combine this ACPA and interferon high score, we can predict more and more number of arthritis patients who can develop a rheumatoid. And there is another a signature called B cell signature. The low signature leads to rheumatoid. So if you combine these interferon signature and B cell signature, and the ACP status, we can uh, predict which subgroup of preclinical rheumatoid uh, going to rheumatoid, uh, preclinical arthritis going to rheumatoid with higher sensitivity and specificity. But there are no yet uh, studies regarding in this aspect. So this is the serum cytokine profile and relatives of RA patients. We can see the relatives, uh, RA patient has got higher cytokines than the relatives, and the relatives has got higher cytokines than the uh, controls indicating the genetic predisposition for the development of autoimmunity and this is another interesting side so as the age progresses those people who are tend to develop rheumatoid arthritis the cytokines and chemokines keep on rising whereas in the those people who didn't develop rheumatoid so the cytokines chemokines remain stable or decreasing and another analysis 
uh, is there any difference in the uh, cytokine uh, uh, cytokine uh, development uh, in the younger age onset group versus elderly age onset uh, rheumatoid arthritis they have found that the younger age onset group of rheumatoid the preclinical phase of the cytokine and chemokinetic elevation is only uh, 2 to 3 years whereas in the elderly age onset group of rheumatoid this preclinical uh, cytokine elevation is seen in much higher that is you can see 4 to 5 years uh, before the development of rheumat that indicates the genetic factors playing a much important role than the cell senses so this is the same study which found that the mcp1 levels are much higher among the all cytokines and the same mcp1 polymorphic promoter gene polymorphisms are associated with rheumatoid and also with the atherosclerosis atherosclerotic heart disease and the same study also showed the increased in mrna of the mcp1 mrna in the uh, peripheral blood mononucleate cells in ra patients compared to controls so these are another important slide the cytokines in the preclinical phase of acpa negative versus acpa positive with the interesting feature of acpa negative a preclinical phase is it has got a shortest preclinical phase when compared to the acpa positive disease and it has got a more explosive onset and the predominant cytokine that was uh, color or that was noted in this study was uh, uh, interleukin 6 so this is another uh, study where they found those undifferentiated arthritis progress to rheumatoid versus undifferentiated who remain undifferentiated so they found that interleukin 15 and monocyte colon stimulating factor are significantly higher uh, and predict uh, can which can predict the development of rheumatoid with the p value of uh, uh, more than 0 0.03 so these two also very important in the preclinical recognition which group of uh, people are going to develop rheumatoid and this is the different micro rnas and this is another cytokine uh, which was found to be elevated in preclinical the high uh, <coughs> clinical uh, uh, value in uh, identifying those people who progress to rheumatoid and then this rheumatoid fls see this is a unique aggressive phenotype the recent study has shown yeah. that the same cells uh, more minute too. Uh, the same cells or uh, increase in the blood of patients who are about to develop uh, uh, rheumatoid and also in the flares so this is uh, also one of the important uh, marker then obesity and preclinical RA clearly shows that obesity associated with preclinical RA and a lot of infections uh, triggering preclinical predominantly upper respiratory tract infections and various hormonal factors so to define preclinical rheumatoid those uh, uh, patients who develop rheumatoid and uh, but they don't have joint pains but who has got anti ccp antibody positive or more than two subtypes of rheumatoid factor positive without detectable arthritis is considered to be preclinical rheumatoid. But can we label them before? According to Euler, we cannot label them before because it, it, it is uh, stigmatizing the individuals. So uh, it is purely for the research purpose. And this is the uh, rheumatological clinical expertise has higher accuracy and sensitivity in uh, CSA than the GPs. And this is the definition of uh, Arthralgias is a purely clinical definition and it has got better sensitivity and specificity than MRI and ultrasound. The MRI studies, bone marrow edema and ACPA uh, combined together has got high propensity. But when you take the clinical uh, scenarios, it has got as good as uh, the clinical, uh, clinical uh, uh, symptoms and the clinical scoring system is as good as the ACPA and MRI bone marrow edema. And some studies shows that MRI, ACPA positive clinical as a tenosynovity is very common. In fact, it is the most common finding. And the ultrasound studies, they don't found much use of ultrasound in the undifferentiated arthritis in the clinically suspected arthralgias. And coming to treatment, uh, primary prevention, secondary prevention, primary prevention before the onset of environmental factors, and secondary prevention after the onset of the environmental factors. And primary prevention, like stop uh, avoiding smoking and uh, regular tooth care or vaccination of P. gingivalis, etc. And secondary uh, prevention by altering if the patient is already a smoker, we can ask them to stop smoking and controlling the BMI. So this is another new way of inducing the tolerance by giving oral citrullated proteins. It can induce uh, regulatory autoantibodies and uh, induction of tolerance to citrullinated peptides. And these are 2017 meta-analysis of 16 animal studies. They showed that in the preclinical phase without antibodies, methotrexate and abortisep was found to be very useful in the mouse experiments. 
and preclinical phase with antibodies treatment was effective in preventing the RA development and they found that methotrexate seemed to be more effective than TNF. This is the 2017 post hoc analysis of 2007 PROM trial. In 2007 PROM trial, they found that methotrexate was not effective. Mother, you can conclude with yeah. Yes, methotrexate is not effective in uh, uh, preventing the development of rheumatoid from undifferentiated, but after adding the laden score of high risk uh, uh, scoring mechanisms, they found, found that methotrexate is effective and the number needed to treat is one in two uh, to prevent RA development. And there is a new targeted methotrexate forms available. And this is uh, last two slides, sir. And this is uh, early arthritis interventional trials, both dexamethasone and rituximab in early arthritis intervention, prevent, preventing the development of rheumatoid, but it's delaying the rheumatoid. So these are the various trials in the pipeline. Even though it, they are started in 2014, 15, yet, yet it, it has to complete because there is difficult to conduct proof of concept studies because of the uh, various reasons in recruiting. And this is uh, another new molecule uh, which can be tried in uh, pre rheumatoid because the gut leak syndrome is very common in uh, pre rheumatoid patients. So, this is actually tried in celiac disease. And then, neural pathways of manipulations. This is very simple. Treatment has shown that the DAS28 CSR levels decrease by vagal stimulation. So, to the suggested approach is. Uh, uh, there is no uh, 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 biomarkers as such uh, evolved to diagnose uh, those preclinical RA food can develop rheumatoid, but we can address various risk factors like obesity, dysmetabolic syndrome, smoking cessation, identifying periodontal disease, and aggressive treatment. And some studies should because oxidative stress is the primary culprit, so there is a role for antioxidants and infection prevention by vaccination or early treatment of infections, altering the gut leak syndrome. And there is still the potential need for specific biomarkers. And till now, what are the animal models that are available? Methotrexate was found to be effective, but this has to be replicated in the clinical trials. And there are various trials that are on pathway in, in, in pathway. And then altering the neural pathways is simplest, best way of uh, uh, handling in clear clinical uh, RA uh, so that we can prevent those groups to develop an RA. But this lot of studies are required to explore this hypothesis. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Dr. Damodaran. Uh, I think you have a little more into the question and answers. Uh, I think there are two, three interesting questions. Uh, I think you all, all, almost answered those questions. The queries were that should we use ultrasound, should we use MRI in the very early course of the disease, which you have said clearly no. And uh, you, there was few questions that were asked that should we use methotrexate and disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drug. I think you have answered in your uh, talk that currently they're all still in trial and uh, you have to think twice before you label the patients as rheumatoid. You have made it clear that not to stigmatize the patient, much more knowing that uh, it should be called as a rheumatoid. So make sure that the diagnosis is right. Uh, I, and the only one interesting question that you can quickly address is that is, is there a way one should treat uh, differentiate between palindromic rheumatism and rheumatoid arthritis. Is there any way we can approaching these two conditions? Yes, the, the, the genomics of uh, palindromic met, uh, rheumatism is different from that of the preclinical rheumatoid, where there is uh, uh, the association with uh, 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 stat polymorphism is much more common. Uh, as by definition, uh, palindromic rheumatism, we cannot compare palindromic with the preclinical rheumatoid because palindromic rheumatism, by definition, they already developed the joint pains. So they have some unique mechanisms that preventing the, uh, that is clearing the disease. So uh, we cannot call this palindromic uh, rheumatism as a preclinical rheumatoid. Okay. I, think, I think that clears the doubt that don't miss, can confuse between the palindromic rheumatism as well as the rheumatoid, early rheumatoid. They are totally two different entities to be handled with a different perspectives. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Damodar, for a uh, uh, nice talk. I think now we move on to uh, the next talk. The next talk is going to uh, discuss on the newer trials which would have implicated on the studies. Uh, Dr. Vinita Shoba, uh, who is a DM uh, immunology from SGPJ, and currently working as a faculty professor and head of the Department of Immunology. And she has a lot of contribution to the rheumatology. Uh, and she has started her DNB course in St. John's uh, 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 Medical College in Bangalore. Uh, I welcome Dr. Vinita to take on the talk further.
the Trinita. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Chandshekhar, for this uh, kind introduction. And I must uh, uh, thank IRA for giving me this uh, opportunity to speak on uh, this very important topic. Now, uh, I hope you can all sh uh, see my screen. No, 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 ma'am. No, no, I think uh, it was there. Yeah, yes. now we can it's there now. All right, okay. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the practice changing uh, trials in last two years. And as you would uh, understand, this is, there are going to, there are so many trials which have uh, uh, changed the way we practice rheumatoid arthritis in last couple of years. And uh, it was very difficult for me to choose which would be the best uh, trials to talk about in this uh, session. More or less last two years, we have been inundated with trials with biologics, the biosimilars and the small molecules. And uh, we have also uh, learned to expand the concept of disease modification. And how's that? So increasingly we uh, are realizing that uh, we need to not only just uh, look at relief of signs and symptoms, but also we need to normalize the physical functioning. The quality of life should come as close to normal as possible. The social and the work capacity too. We of course need to reduce the occurrence or progression of structural damage to cartilage and bone. We also are struggling at this point to find out which would be the optimal dosing or sequence of a single uh, treatment for rheumatoid arthritis or whether we should use a combination of uh, molecules. Lastly, we must remember that despite the uh, number of successful therapies for rheumatoid arthritis, which we've had in last two years, only half of the patients are actually in good remission and 10 to 15% of the patients still remain refractory. And we must remember that there is no cure for this disease as of now. So when I started preparing for this talk, I thought we could discuss a little bit about biosimilars. We could talk a little bit about targeted uh, synthetic TMRs. And very importantly, we must touch on cost effectiveness and how COVID has impacted the treatment for rheumatoid arthritis patients. Now, uh, starting with the biosimilars, we all know that uh, they have highly similar physicochemical characteristics and biological activity, and they have equivalent efficacy, and there is no meaningful difference between the originator and the biosimilars uh, in terms of safety and immunogenicity. Now, when we start talking about biosimilars, while we've had them in our country for more than five years now, the uh, EU and the uh, US, the Western population is just getting uh, to use them in their clinical practice. And here, what we can see is the number of uh, biosimilars which are available in the uh, Western world. Uh, we've had etanercept, adalumumab, and infliximab for quite some time. Of course, adalumumab, the original molecule, has not come to India ever. Rituximab is the biosimilars are approved only for uh, malignancies and for uh, uh, anchor associated vasculitis in the Western world, while in India, we are able to use them for, for uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis and all other possible indications. Uh, there have been numerous uh, studies which have shown bioequivalence and efficacy of biosimilars over the last few years. Uh, I found this very elegant study uh, using biosimilars wherein the uh, patients, uh, this is with respect to the adalumumab biosimilar. Here then you see that there are four arms of the uh, trial and this was the biosimilar which was being tried here. So they randomized half the patients into either the biosimilar molecule or into the originator. And then at six months, 24 weeks, they again randomize the patients either to continue the originator molecule or to switch to the biosimilar. And what they found was that ACR20, ACR50, ACR70, all of them were equal or similar in all the four arms. That means that these biosimilar was perfect. Now, uh, these biosimilars have a lesser cost and uh, that is leading to overall reduction in the cost 
for the patient to the society and to the regulatory or and to the government agencies or the insurance agencies and this reduction in cost the easily availability of the biosimilars has also led to increase in the use of biosimilars across the world as we have also seen in our country that uh, we are more and more using the biosimilars than the original molecules now here what the western world is uh, is uh, inundated with nocebo responses wherein there is the patient feels a subjective increase of disease activity and pain related adverse event when they change from originator to a biosimilar molecule fortunately in india we haven't had this issue because many very few of our patients are actually using the uh, original molecule now this paper we published uh, last year this is uh, karnataka biologics cohort and in this we looked at the prescribing patterns of biologics in our uh, rheumatology patients and what we found was that this study was done in 2016 2017 what we found was that at that time itself we were uh, using quite a few of our patients as biosimilars almost two third of our patients were actually using biosimilars if you repeat this study now i'm sure that more than 90% of our patients will be actually using biosimilars rather than original molecules next moving on to the targeted synthetic dmrs yesterday dr maya butch has uh, uh, presented very eloquently about the targeted synthetic dmrs and we already are uh, have been uh, Uh, told about the uh, different uh, jack inhibitors we know about the first generation and the second generation uh, jack inhibitors we all have seen over last couple of years the mammoth trials with these targeted synthetic dmrs they long term extension trials uh, spanning into tens of thousands of patient years we are very uh, familiar with their mode of administration which is by oral route and their uh, reversibility because of their short duration of action the lower manufacturing costs and the favorable pharmacoeconomic impact on the uh, patient's uh, life is very very uh, important uh, in this context so uh, we have seen a lot of trials uh, of uh, these targeted synthetic dmrs across the world and india of course has participated in many of these trials so this was a effort by uh, the investigators as well as the uh, these uh, manufacturers of this drug tofacitinib to look at the indian data and that is very important for us because our challenges are of course different from the challenges which is faced by the people across the world and in this what we found was that compared to the rest of the world patients the indian patients were younger we had lower bmi shorter uh, are a duration and a higher baseline disease activity and as we were talking just a little bit earlier that most of our patients were non smokers and in this study we found that almost all of our patients not almost all all were actually bio uh, biologics naive so in this study we had 197 indian patients and about 3800 patients from the rest of the world were included and what we found was that the indian patients had numerically fewer uh, adverse events fewer serious adverse events the rate of discontinuation was similar in both the groups in the indian patients as well as in the rest of the world patients however the incidence rate of tb was slightly higher compared to the rest of the world now when we look at the efficacy this here we have the uh, data from the indian patients and here we have the data from the rest of the world patients and we find that the indian patients had almost similar responses as compared to the rest of the world probably a shade uh, better responses however this was not uh, really uh, statistically significant the uh, in terms of the uh, hack responses also indian patients were quite comparable with the rest of the world now when we look at the adverse events and most importantly we would want to look at tuberculosis and there were seven patients who had tuberculosis during clinical trials and uh, uh, all of them all of these seven patients had had at least at some time in their uh, lifespan with uh, tofacitinib had used 10 mg uh, dosing of tofacitinib uh, but we know that the approved dosage is 5 mg twice a day uh, apart from that there were no major uh, worrying uh, facts and if you look at the herpes zoster the incidence ratio uh, ratio was 2.93 
And when we look at the rest of the world, it was 3.62. So again, this was not a challenge in our patients. So a very important uh, thing which we realized while uh, writing this paper was that uh, there were 23 Indian patients who had latent TB infection at baseline in the phase three studies. And all of these patients received uh, the prophylaxis uh, treatment. None of them developed tuberculosis post-administration of tofacetinib. So this was very good. All the seven patients who developed uh, uh, tuberculosis uh, did not have latent tuberculosis at the time of uh, start into the trial. The mean time to onset of tuberculosis was shorter in Indian patients compared to the rest of the world patients. The laboratory abnormalities were more or less similar. And there were no cases of uh, venous thromboembolism in the Indian patients in safety analysis yet. The rate of discontinuation uh, due to adverse events as well as the incidence of mortality was also similar across the trials between uh, India and uh, the rest of the world. Now, what about the real life experience with tofacitinib? And this is a slide, this is unpublished work from uh, Dr. Vijay K. Rao. And we find that the, uh, the real life experience with tofacitinib has also been fantastic. And the side effects are actually quite few. Now, uh, we know that uh, there are long term data coming up uh, with both uh, tofacitinib and baricitinib. Uh, similar to tofacitinib, when we look at baricitinib, the, uh, the long-term uh, experience with baricitinib in the clinical trials has been very good. And in this study, this is a study called as RA Beyond, in which uh, their patients were, uh, the, uh, there were 423 patients uh, included who switched from RA Begin to RA Beyond. And we, what we find is that the patients who had the uh, uh, continued into the long-term extension phase. The RA begin actually had three different arms. The patients could either be on placebo or two milligram baricitinib or four milligram baricitinib. So the patients, uh, when they continue to have a good lower disease activity in the RA beyond study as assessed by the SDI, CDI and the HACPM. The safety outcomes were also similar in all of these patients in all the uh, arms. The uh, safety of baricitinib was presented uh, last year in Iracon in the Indian uh, cohort of the trial patients. And they looked at 131 patients and we found that uh, the baricitinib was also well tolerated in Indian patients. There were no cases of DVT in this population and the results were consistent with that with the overall population included in the rest of the world study. Uh, ULAB 2020 this year, uh, baricitinib data has been presented in which they looked at the safety up to 8.4 years. Both the efficacy as well as safety, there are no new concerns, no new safety signals were identified. So what happens when there is in real life, we have to uh, uh, interrupt the treatment of with baricitinib. So this study is very interesting study in which they looked at the uh, uh, in treatment interruptions and uh, this included uh, the four studies, RA Begin, RA Beam, RA Build, and RA Beacon. And when they looked at the interruptions, they found that the reasons for interruptions could be any, like it could be an adverse event or a uh, lab abnormality or patient's decision, or the investigator decision. Most of the times, the interruptions were less than two weeks. And uh, then they, uh, the treatment was restarted, which was done in about 85% of patients. There was no... Uh, significant loss of response between the uh, people who had treatment interruptions and versus those who did not have the interruption as can be very clearly seen. It's quite understandable that we're not going to get head-to-head uh, -head trials of JAK inhibitors in uh, patients of rheumatoid arthritis. So network meta-analysis uh, is very important to look at the comparative efficacy of uh, JAK inhibitors. In this paper, which was published recently, they looked at 11 RCTs and they found that uh, the remission outcomes at 12 and 24 weeks for all JAK inhibitors, which are currently approved, that is three of them, was more or less similar. And uh, they all had better effic efficacy than the conventional synthetic TMRs. The difference in efficacy measures were not statistically significant between the various JAK inhibitors.
And this is one uh, beautiful diagram from that paper which shows the uh, responses at week 12 and week 24. And you look at the various uh, combinations of uh, uh, these jackanips along with these CSDMRs or along with the uh, 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 or alone as can be seen here. And here what we see is that the, the efficacy is more or less similar across the uh, various combinations. The various drugs have done almost similar across the above. Two more minutes to start with. Yeah. So when we look at the comparative efficacy and safety of tofacitinib, paracetinib, ubtacinib, filgocitinib, and pethocitinib, here we find that uh, in this meta-analysis, this came from uh, Korea. Here again, they they try to do a network meta-analysis and they found that the best treatment responses are actually with pethocitinib followed by filgotinib. Next, coming to the cost effectiveness. So this is a very beautiful study in which they did a patient level microstimulation model and they changed the therapy every six months based on the change in the hack if it was less than 0 0.35. And they used uh, studies to, uh, with, uh, they used four scenarios in which two of them were in DMR in, uh, uh, inadequate responder population and in two of them they were in a TNF inadequate responder population. And what we find is that the people who, the uh, groups which had tofacitinib uh, uh, at the initial time of the uh, start of the sequence, they all had lower cost in all the four scenarios. Similarly, a study has been done for baricitinib and here again they found that the incremental cost of uh, compared to adalimumab was quite significant with a gain in the uh, quality adjusted life years. Similarly, there have been cost effectiveness trials for TNF inhibitors uh, with uh, combination DMRs. And here again, we find that the gain is quite a lot. So lastly, coming to the impact of COVID and uh, rheumatoid arthritis treatment, we have all, quite a few of us have changed to almost complete uh, virtual consultations. And patients uh, are uh, finding it quite difficult to uh, reach the hospitals and we have all learned the new normal. And the impact of COVID, uh, we were initially quite worried about uh, what it would be on rheumatic diseases and the, many of the guidelines came up quite quickly. This is one of the guidelines uh, from ACR and in this they looked at the retrospective cohort studies, the preliminary uh, cohort studies and they found that risk factor for poor outcome was in people who had older age and those who had underlying chronic lung disease or other comorbidities. Uh, the guidelines for inflammatory arthritis eventually went on to say that we could probably continue everything that we were using earlier. And if and when we required to add biologics, we could do so without, uh, uh, in, without exposing our patients to a major risk. And glucocorticoids, if possible, to use in a less, lesser dose as, as much as low as possible. And we should not stop the uh, glucocorticoids abruptly. BSR came up with some guideline recommendations and they told uh, that if the patient had a score of three or more, these are the people who needed to be put in. The people with a score of two uh, or uh, would probably require both social distancing and uh, uh, staying away from crowded areas. But if the patient had a score of one, the risk factor was one, then they just needed to uh, live more or less a normal life uh, along with uh, the masking and social distancing. So as soon as this uh, COVID thing came up, we quickly in our one of our COVID meetings in the Karnataka Rheumatology Association uh, decided to have a study on uh, uh, COVID-19, whether what will happen to, we wanted to basically see what is happening to our patients. And this was a prospective multi-center non-interventional longitudinal ongoing study. And uh, this, we have just uh, sent it for publication uh, uh, Brief, uh, as a brief report, the interim analysis. This is an ongoing study involving 14 rheumatology centers. We quickly created a case record form and we started collecting data on all our patients. Uh, we are making them monthly telephone calls to find out if they're having any COVID-like symptoms or what are their exposure risks. So when we looked at our data just a couple of days back, uh, we tried to do the first interim analysis on 10th, uh, we put the stop date as 10th of August, we found that uh, most of our patients, of course, were women. We found that 41 of these 3,807 patients, which we included in our study, 
were tested for COVID-19 using RT-PCR and 0.6%, 23 of these patients were detected positive. In this, the parameters which were associated with COVID-19 positivity were elderly people, diabetes, hypertension, presence of underlying lung disease, uh, current use of glucocorticoids, the past use of glucocorticoids, and few of the other medications in the, uh, which the patients had used in past. So uh, the, we were trying to figure out mainly if hydroxychloroquine, there was a uh, significant difference and we did not find any such thing. In the multivariate analysis, we eventually figured that underlying lung disease was the most important independent risk factor after adjusting for variables, which was which is associated with uh, COVID positivity. Uh, diabetes mellitus was another important factor, which was associated with risk of developing COVID positivity. When we look at the incidence rates, we did not find any difference between our KRA COVID cohort and the Karnataka COVID database. We had three mortalities uh, in out of these 23 patients, and all of them were elderly with multiple comorbidities. So. What we concluded is that outcome was favorable in most of our patients. There was no association with hydroxychloroquine use and higher dose of glucocorticoids was associated with an increased risk. And there is really no great uh, increased risk uh, of COVID-19 compared to the general population. The risk factors uh, for infection are same, which is in the normal population as well. So briefly, we've looked at uh, a bit about biosimilar DMRs. We've done a little bit about, talked a little bit about the cost effectiveness. We've talked some bit about newer things which was not covered yesterday. Not newer, different things which were not covered yesterday about the targeted synthetic DMRs. And we talked a bit about impact of COVID-19 on our RA patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vinita. I think. Um... I think we are just uh, right on the time, which include the question and answer. I mean, there are quite a few questions which have cropped in. I, I probably, if time permits, we can take it in the end. The major questions were more on the tofacitinib and few of those tricky areas. Uh, I think there were a few questions which were more related on um, various aspects of COVID and others. I think we can take those answers uh, through email and respond to the respective uh, uh, delegates who have enthusiastically put their questions. We'll forward all those questions to the uh, respective speakers and we'll get back to you on those areas. Uh, thank you very much. And I will hand over uh, Dr. Rath to proceed further. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vinita. Thank, thank you. you. With that, we come to the, uh, the last and the most uh, illuminous speaker of today, uh, Dr. Daniel Aletaha. And uh, Dr. Daniel Aletaha is the chair for rheumatology. He's also the head of Department of Rheumatology at the Medical University of Vienna. But we all know him as the lead author for his excellent paper on the 2000 classification of rheumatoid arthritis. Not only that, he's an active expert committee task force member for laying down the management guidelines for diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis. Also, he's on the task force which decides on the treat to target recommendations. Uh, I would, uh, he has more than 200 publications to his name. I would uh, request Dr. Daniel Aletaha to start his topic, but just a brief before that. So as, he's, as, he's, as the topic is remission is target, but what is remission? Are we talking of clinical remission? Are we talking of radiological remission? Are we talking of serological remission? Are we talking of pathological remission or everything in total? Let's see what he has to say. Dr. Daniel, please. Uh, please unmute your mic, Dr. Daniel, and I would request all of the other panelists to mute themselves. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for a very kind introduction, and uh, it's great to be there virtually, um, uh, although it's probably not the same like being there physically. Um, I'm thinking about the good company, but I'm also thinking about the excellent um, food. <laughs> No, but I, I hope that uh, we in the future will have the opportunity to get over this um, sort of uh, strange reality that we have right now. But it's good to see you and uh, it's good to be part. And if you allow, I would give my uh, presentation on remission and share my screen. I'll try that now. So. Yes, so we you can see the screen. Yes, we can. Okay, good. And then let me see if you can also see the pointer. Yeah. 
Good. Uh, so remission is the target. I think that's a very um, straightforward title and not very surprising after we've discussed this for many years. Um, but I put a little note to that, which is what is remission at all, because this I think is an important aspect of, of, of the question. So let me start with remission is the target and the obvious. And uh, we have uh, talked about remission as a target for many years and treat to target recommendations really brought this to the point with the primary recommendation, as you can see here, being uh, a remission, clinical remission being the primary target for management of rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, this was in the original treat to target, but also in the update, of course, um, the clear, uh, first bullet point. And the reason is really that we think about RA and many other diseases, uh, psoriatic arthritis, but also uh, other chronic inflammatory diseases um, outside of, of the uh, arthritis as having a disease process that leads to damage and functional impairment um, at the same time. And that we really need to treat to target disease the disease process to a minimum, which we call remission, but we need to define it, of course, because if we do that, and if we do that from the beginning, and here we're linking in, into the um, uh, early diagnosis story, if you do it from the beginning, uh, and consequently, then you really have no, have patients without any stigma of disease. They will have to take treatment probably, but um, they will not have any stigma uh, from the disease. Now, Coming to the second part, what is remission? Or maybe also asking the question, what is it not? Because remission is um, a very popular term and people use it in many different, I think, uh, situations and contexts. Um, maybe we can start by looking at the ACI EULA definition of remission. And I keep saying this was 2011, and this was the first time that there was a uniform definition of remission presented to the community. But if you look at it, of course, it's partly uniform because it gives several options as well. And you know that um, uh, one of the options is the so-called Boolean criteria, uh, which you know is, is, is a combination of several criteria that need to be fulfilled for swollen tender joints and patient global and CRP. Uh, to be each of them less or equal one. Um, it's alternatively allowing for an index-based definition that um, more has the same, more or less has the same components. You can see there is an evaluator global as well, the the, C, the, the SDI, but the sum of these variables needs to be below a cut point. So in that sense, the, the index-based definition allows a little bit, you know, one or the other variable being slightly higher than one if the others compensate for that. And there is a clinical version that was also published in that document that um, uses Boolean without CRP and SDI without CRP, which is the CDI, for clinical practice where you might not have the um, acute phase reactants, the measurements available, so you can make, still can make immediate treat to target, target decisions without waiting for results. So some of you have probably asked what happened to the good old DAS or DAS28. This is the, the, the score or index that has been used over so many years and so successfully. And uh, the, one of the problems was, of course, that the DAS28 remission uh, revealed, uh, or the, the, the error of remission uh, revealed that the DAS28 score has a problem when patients really come to the lower end of the scale. It was developed for moderately active patients or highly active patients in the 1990s. But in remission, you found that 70% uh, of patients with uh, DAS28 remission really have zero swollen joints. And 30% have more than zero swollen joints. They have one, two, three, four, five. They can have uh, up to 12 swollen joints and still um, uh, being a remission by the DAS28. And you can see that here also in a study from uh, Desiree van der Heide, uh, when you look at the middle column here, DAS28 remission, remitters, and you can see this is 70% again with zero swollen joints, and the rest has one, two, three, or even more uh, uh, than uh, that uh, swollen joints. So this is consistent with the data that sh I showed you in the previous slide. And uh, it tells us that DAS28 remission well, 
in many patients it is indeed remission, but in many as well, it is something that rheumatologists would not consider remission. That is, if there is swollen joints present. Uh, and this is the explanation to it. It looks complicated. It is not so much. This is just a calculation of how much each component of the DAS28, and you know the scale of the DAS28, how much each component, say tender joints, swollen joints, global health, or ESR, contribute um, to the DAS28 scale, to the whole score, by the way they're transformed and weighted. And what you can see here is that if you have really 28 swollen joints, you get 1.5 um, on the scale for the DAS28. So you increase or contribute with 1.5 on the total DAS score. To get the same contribution to the DAS score by tender joints, you can see you only need seven tender joints to have 1.5 contribution to the DAS score. So this is a dis disconnect between um, tenderness and swelling, and um, this, in fact, is a clear, clearly showing a problem that was evident for um, uh, many years. That tenderness is strongly weighted uh, in the DAS28 as opposed to swollen joints, and you can see that by the simple, you know, fact that it's twice as heavily in the score. Uh, but you can also see that um, for the ESR, it it has a very steep contribution through the log and the weight um, and the normal range. You can see this is an ESR of 15 um, contributing a, a total of two to the DAS score. And if you have a patient improving from 15, which is normal to, to five, um, you get um, an improvement in the DAS score of almost the whole point just by moving an ESR within the normal range um, uh, or within the range of normal. So tenderness and acute phase are strongly weighted in the DAS, and this is very similar also in the DAS CRP. Now, people proposed to, and we're still answering the question, what happened to the DAS 28 or DAS, if you remember, so I'm, I'm finished in a second, but people tried to propose a solution to the DAS um, problem uh, and said, well, we have so many swollen joints, in DAS remission, so why don't we just um, reduce the cut point for remission and say, um, well, the DAS ESR cut point can be reduced to a lower number. And if you can look at this here, this is um, a suggestion um, of a DAS ESR cut point reduced to 2.2, and um, this is the suggestion to reduce the DAS CRP cut point to 1.9, so much lower than the, 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 the current uh, cut point of the DAS 28 remission. But you can see compared to the CDI, um, and this is again the, where 90% of patients have zero swollen joints in remission, you can see that this is still um, not resolving the problem. The problem is in the formula and the weighting of the DAS. It's not necessarily the cut point. So if you just move the cut point down, you may get fewer patients in remission, but they may not necessarily look different. And you can see there's still the room of having many swollen joints in remission, even if you lower the cut points. While with the s die or c die, you can always have a maximum of two swollen joints in remission. But there is another problem uh, that I would like to, to um, briefly discuss on, on this one slide. And this is the, um, the potential assessment bias that we get when a, an index like the DAS28 um, has a very strong weighting of the acute phase. And um, this is now um, an example of uh, clinical trials, where you can see in, in trials of non-cytokine targeted uh, uh, trials like Abatacep trial and the Rituximab trial, the, the relation between ACR50 responders and ACR70 responders and DAS28 remitters. You can see the DAS28 remitters, um, it's about the same number of patients, proportion of patients as 70% uh, improvers. So you could argue, well, that's maybe we would clinically say 
remission should be more than 70% improvement, but 70% improvement and remission it can be the same. Um, when you look at IL-6 target, and here we are with the uh, acute phase um, assessment bias, we know that IL-6 tar uh, treatments target the acute phase very strongly and partly independently from uh, clinical activity. When you use a DAS-28 score for, for that purpose, you can see that, for example, for the RADIATE trial in, of docilizumab, suddenly you get the same number of patients reaching remission by the DAS as the proportion reaching an ACR50 response. So even more patients reaching a remission than a 50% response. And you can see the ACR measure is the same as in these trials. It's the DAS score that behaves differently. And this is a big problem for an index, for a disease activity index, if it doesn't treat all treatments evenly, but has an assessment bias for certain type of treatments which the ACR uh, doesn't have, uh, but the, the uh, strong CRP weighted um, DAS CRP does have. And it's the same for TNF targeted, um, so cytokine targeted. You can see here again, almost the same number of uh, remitters by DAS and ACR 50. So 50%, we would not consider uh, a remission usually. Um, so this is the brief, <laughs> Uh, sort of um, um, trip to the question of why we are not uh, finding the DAS or DAS 28 in the ACI EULA remission criteria. Now, what could one could ask now is remission really necessary? Because it seems like everyone's saying that and it's, it has become a dogma that remission is the ultimate goal. And of course, we and others have shown that if you look at, for example, the HES assessment questionnaire and in the middle it's perfect and uh, outside it's worse. If you look at patients in remission in the light blue and as opposed to low disease activity, they are functioning better. Remission, remittive patients are functioning better than low disease activity patients. And this is the same um, for the SF36 where the scale is inverse. So the wider is better. So you can see that the function, the uh, quality of life is better for remitters, a light blue, and for uh, low disease activity patients. So this is one argument maybe for going into remission. And also you can find that um, cardiovascular risk factors improve um, in, in remission, best in remission. And I'm just going quickly over this, but if you look at active RA versus RA in remission, you can see that the uh, systolic blood pressure is significantly lower or the cardiovascular score, the risk, um, composite risk, risk measure is significantly lower. And you can see that uh, comorbidities in general, when you look at Boolean, but particularly when you look at STI based definition of remission is significantly better uh, in terms of prevalence when you are in remission as opposed to not remission. But low disease activity is an alternative target and you find it in the uh, future target publication as well and in the recommendations. And uh, here's the number three where it says, well, it's an acceptable alternative. Um, it gives one situation where it might be an acceptable alternative, which is um, particularly in established long-standing disease. Um, this was never really um, uh, cl clarified in more detail, but just um, making the point that uh, established long-standing RA might be more difficult to treat than an early active process. But one point for uh, low disease activity as an alternative target, of course, is also that um, progression of structural damage. Um, if you look um, here at methotrexate patients uh, who reach different states, is clearly associated with disease activity levels that these patients are in. But if you add biologics to this, um, uh, to, to the treatment, you can see that really there is no progression in remission, but also no progression in low disease activity. And only if you have higher levels of disease activity, progression is detectable again. So structural damage is detectable again. So this is um, one argument or has been taken as one argument of saying, well, 
or low disease activity might be an alternative target for patients if patients are on a biologic therapy because if they're fine we can be relatively sure that they will not increase the damage over time based on the clinical data and this is um uh, this is data from um, from uh, infliximab, but you can find the same thing. And we we and others have published that here. A study by Landeve and and two other studies by ourselves um, for another TNF inhibitor, etanercept, but also for IL-6 inhibition and B-cell depletion. That there is this type of dissociation um, in all types of biologics um, uh, detectable. Dissociation meaning that patients do not progress of both more clinical remission is not present and uh, another situation of course where low disease activity might be acceptable um, instead of remission is um, what is shown here um, what paul studenitz did here was he looked at patients who were reaching near emission and uh, until now several studies have been able to replicate these numbers um, so they if you take the boolean remission criteria he looked at those patients who only had three out of four and not all four criteria you remember these four criteria each of them had to be less or equal one like shown here and if you just look at those who missed one criterion you can ask the question how often is which criteria missing and you can see that in 60 percent of cases the one missing was patient global meaning everything else was normal but the patient global was too high and um, we are all not surprised by this finding because we know that our patients um, global scores are usually a little bit higher than the global scores that we give to our patients um, and uh, one explanation for this is that patient global, although the question is formulated at, at the impact of disease activity and severity of disease activity from RA, patients translate non-inflammatory pain or pain in general also to disease activity, which we as physicians may not do so much. And we can actually model this, and this is based on this data here. This is the probability of being in the group uh, failing remission simply because the patient global is not normal. And you can see if you, if you take pain into consideration, you can see there's a clear association. If, if you have a pain score of 20 of, out of 100, your probability of missing remission with everything else being normal, missing remission just because your patient global is too high for the Boolean criteria is about 80%. So, this is an issue and we are currently discussing the possibility to increase the cut point of the patient global um, for the Boolean criteria from one to two. And um, we have recently published a study on that uh, as well and are um, actually um, discussing with ACR and EULA now um, a slight revision of that um, because the patient global uh, cut point for, of one is a very stringent, stringent one and may prevent patients from going into remission which is not a problem if you realize it, but if you want to switch off your brain and just treat to target to remission, this may lead to overtreatment um, because patients are fine on the inflammatory side, but still not reach remission. And depression is the most frequent comorbidity. And depression is linked to non-inflammatory pain. So this issue is relevant for our patients. This is data from the um, a large um, observational study, the Comora trial, um, where comorbidities were looked at uh, in a large patient group in Europe. And this really depression has a high prevalence in um, the comorbidities of RA. And of course, we need to consider comorbidities when we are deciding which disease activity measures we are taking in patients, but uh, we need to consider comorbidities also uh, when we interpret the results of our uh, measurements. And like uh, CRP can be in elevated in infections, uh, we have to be aware that pain can trigger elevations of patient global uh, because of um, uh, the presence of depression. <clears throat> 
but there's other words, voices as well, and they are not saying, um, do we need remission? Can we take low disease effectivity as an alternative? They're saying, well, clinical remission is not enough. We need more than that. We need to go for imaging remission, uh, for example. And indeed, uh, there was in the, in the first edition of the Treat to Target, this was in the research agenda, then we, uh, without reading this to you, but essentially asking the question, what is the value of using imaging techniques such as ultrasound or MRI um, in addition to clinical assessment as a target? So trying to get not only the clinical well-being uh, as part of the remission, but also finding nothing on ultrasound and nothing on MRI. Um, a study that would investigate that would take a group of patients and then randomize them to, you know, a clinical trial, a clinical target arm and a clinical plus imaging target arm. So both arms would get the same escalation in therapy with the same types of drugs, but the time point would be a little bit different because in arm one, you would just escalate to the next treatment when you are failing clinical remission. Well, where in the other arm, you're escalating in clinical when you're failing clinical remission, but also if you're in clinical remission and you have signals on imaging, you're still escalating. And the question really is, is this arm here giving any benefits when you measure it at the end uh, on your outcomes? And is there a clinical relevance of, you know, switching uh, upon imaging, even although you are in, in clinical remission? And there were trials actually who were, that investigated this exactly by this design. And this was the Arctic trial that you know, it was a couple of years ago published, um, um, uh, already a, a couple of years ago. It um, um, has done the exact thing, uh, arm one and arm two randomized trial, pretty big uh, with remission, thus less than 1.6 and another arm that goes for remission and imaging remission, meaning no ultrasound power Doppler signal, which is only possible in early RA. And this was an early RA cohort. And the end point, the outcomes on the end of the trial were clinical remission, no swollen joints and non-progression of radiographic joint damage. And what you can see here is the primary endpoint assessment that was in 22% in the imaging in the ultrasound type control, where there's 19% in the conventional type to control, clearly missing statistical significance. And if you look at the disease activity score over 24 weeks, you can see it was pretty similar and there was no difference. You can see that say this is one trial, it might be different in another trial. Now, if the TASER, when the TASER trial did the same thing, in a slightly different design, but also comparing a clinical decision point to a clinical plus musculoskeletal ultrasound decision point, essentially they found the same thing in terms of uh, clinical activity and in terms of function. No differences in clinical activity or function in causes variable. So this is in early arthritis even, in established uh, RA, this is even more difficult to treat to target to an ultrasound remission. What we did here was a retrospective study uh, based on a single ultrasound that we did on non-swollen joints. And we, did, we quantified whether the, the, the ultrasound uh, signal on grayscale was one, two, or three in these non-swollen joints. And then we tracked back in our database, when was the last time point that this non-swollen joint clinically was clinically swollen. And what you can see here is that if you take an ultrasound today and you find a joint um, with a grayscale of three, which is pretty thick uh, synovia, then the time until last swelling is much shorter than if you find presently a grayscale two or grayscale one. What does this tell us implicitly? It's not a prospective study, but it tells us that if you maintain the non-clinical swelling over time, your subclinical signal also gets smaller. And the same is true for power Doppler. If you find a power Doppler 3, patients with a power Doppler 3 signal, um, and we published it uh, uh, five years ago, uh, with a power Doppler 3 signal have clearly sh shorter time in clinical remission of that joint than those with a power Doppler 2 or power Doppler 1. So this led us to 
you know, a more um, schematic approach to saying that um, the target should probably be clinical remission still, and it's coming back to our initial question, do we need more to that than clinical remission? But if you take, you know, the timing, clinical remission and subclinical activity, and that can be imaging, that can be a biomarker, that can be anything else that you can think of or not even can think of yet because we have not discovered it yet. But the point is, the longer you sustain the clinical remission, the, the better your subclinical inflammation will be and is, is very likely to be. And if you have a very specific imaging sign, it might go down very more quickly. If you have, you know, um, very sensitive biochemical imaging, it may take longer for full remission on imaging because you're so sensitive that you're detecting very small um, images and, and signs of inflammation. But the point here is, or the message really is, sustaining clinical remission probably can save you a lot of effort in doing imaging techniques and all, also a lot of cost probably by doing imaging techniques that are expensive because simply maintaining clinical remission might, might do it. And in fact, this has also been shown uh, for um, uh, MRI. And this is again one of these trials that has compared a clinical versus a, um, uh, an MRI arm. And this is the clinical arm where escalation was only DAS based. And this is the MRI arm where multiple MRIs were done. And this is probably not feasible anyway in clinical practice. But the result was that there was no difference on primary outcome. There were some differences on secondary outcome, to be fair. But uh, multiple MRIs over time um, is, um, is probably unlikely anyway. So I'm sorry for background noise, but it's a, quite a thunderstorm here in Austria at the moment. Um, so I just want to make a final point, and I hope I'm not too far over my allotted time, but um, gaining sensitivity on, image, on, on remission does not always mean we need to have fancy um, imaging techniques like ultrasound, MRI, speed, whatever, or uh, biomarkers. Think about joint swelling clinically. There is a, this is a continuum. There is patients without, you know, joints without swelling and there's joints with clear swelling. We examine it physically. You know, people think, some people think that's old fashioned, but it's very simple. And it's, I think, what every rheumatologist should be doing. But there is a big gray zone between the clearly not swollen joints and the clearly swollen joints. And I think this is, this is the final point that I would like to make, that how do we interpret this middle zone? And the middle zone, we know, if you look at kappas between um, assessment of two, two rheumatologists of individual joints, you can see it's a very poor agreement. So we are likely also to disagree because we're dealing lot of, a lot of times with patients in this middle zone. This is why we're disagreeing as physicians on joint exam. We're probably not disagreeing here or not disagreeing here, but this is why we get lots of disagreement. Um, so we ask the question, is this middle group also in terms of inflammation and middle group? And um, we looked at the EULA handbook of joint assessment and it says the following, when in doubt, a joint should be considered as non-swollen. So the EULA textbook um, uh, really is laid out for um, specificity and not sensitivity. And what are we trying to do with doing MRIs and ultrasound? We're trying to increase our sensitivity, while at the same time, when we do our clinical exam, we limit ourselves currently to being specific, just claiming swelling if there is true swelling and in doubt. We know. So we said, well, let's look at this. We had two, uh, we had two assessors rating a joint um, not swollen, doubtful as one, and clearly swollen. And since it's two, you get middle groups as well that are the average. And then we did grayscale on these joints. And you can see for the grayscale, as, we, as well as for the power Doppler, you can see between the uh, uh, consensus of non-swelling and the consensus of swelling, there's a clear increase uh, depending on the level of uh, assessment of these two people. 
uh, and you don't get it as a negative control when you do that with osteophytes. So one proposal would be maybe to do it this way. This would probably get us the sensitivity that we're looking at. So when we are in doubt, really, in a patient who has the disease, of course, then we could consider it um, as swollen, maybe. So we can save a lot of imaging uh, time and also costs. So the mission to remission is an ultimate goal to go to remission. And uh, in, I showed you that it, uh, the evidence that it best improves comorbidity. Um, we need to clearly define what we mean with remission, otherwise it's not more than an appealing term. But also, not every patient needs to be in remission. And I made a few points about established RA, isolated pain, um, uh, and, and um, potentially patients who are treated with biologics because they don't progress. These were the three scenarios. Um, imaging remission can be a targeting clinical practice, and people should use it if they have the resources and the time for it but it should not be recommended as a, a treatment target approach because it's not clearly showing benefits. And maybe we can get the sensitivity increased by simpler methods by simply changing our perspective on the clinical joint exam. So with this, I'm at the end of my presentation. I thank you all very much for your attention and I look forward to having some discussion. Thank you, Dr. Daniel. Wonderful talk, excellent talk. Uh, I think I think you very nicely summarized the problem of remission definition in today's time. The, the limitations with Boolean never score low on the patient global assessment, and then the problems with the DAS28 being the, the 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 acute phase reactants would skew it, especially with drugs like tocilizumab and and tofacitinib. What uh, I just wanted to take the first question before the audience is that we've done a small study, and this is one of the papers of my DNB students in radiology, which was. Uh, Given the best paper award in South Asian Radiology Forum. What we try to look at is we try to compare the DAS 28 with the ultrasound. And we found is that joints which are only tender may or may not represent disease activity. Joints which are only swollen, as you said, may not always represent disease activity. But the joint which is both tender and swollen perhaps you know, gives us the best marker of disease activity. And perhaps what the problem is we club all the tender joints and swollen joints. We're not looking at individualistic joints. So, so probably we felt that incorporating ultrasound into an outcome measure like a CDI or a DAS-28, wherein, because we know there's a lot of problem, there's a, you know, individual variability on assessing a joint as tender or swollen. And specifically with the deeper joints, you know, the more a deeper a joint, superficial joints probably is easy to say swollen or not swollen. But as in, as you go into a deeper joint, like say a shoulder or a knee, I can tell you a lot of people cannot assess what is swelling, what is swollen. And ultrasound can really come up with sometimes very, very amazing. And the point is very, very taken that either you take it, if you want to increase the sensitivity, you call it swollen. If it is not, you probably, for specificity, you leave it. Uh, so basically, uh, we take some of the questions. And the questions that are coming in is that basically, once you talk of remission, no matter what we use, what would we do once a patient is in remission? And that brings me to the question of imaging. Would you think imaging would be a useful tool to decide when to uh, you know, de-escalate therapy in a patient in remission. That's what the studies have shown. Uh, and plus, there's a recent study in arthritis care, uh, which has shown that grayscale synovitis, if persistent, can lead to damage. So this question is from Dr. Ram Pratipati. He says, what are the guidelines for a RA treatment in a patient who is in remission? Yeah, these guidelines are um, uh, essentially, the, as guidelines, non-existing, non really. Because even in the most recent update of the EULA management recommendations, the, the, it, 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 it's still formulated very vaguely because there's multiple factors, as you also indicated, that may um, predict the flare in a patient who is in clinical remission. And one of which might be absence of um, high sensitivity CRP, so a biomarker. Uh, another one might be absence of a really uh, uh, inflammation on ultrasound um, as an imaging biomarker. I, I, I showed you some evidence about the problem of the absence of synovitis and absence of power doppler in established RA. It takes a potentially very long time until this really goes away. But it might be something that if you have a patient where you really are able to detect no signals in the previously affected joints, of course, 
and this needs to be target joints that were problematic or were inflamed before, and you are now in remission. If you don't find signals in these joints anymore, you should certainly more um, confident that this patient will flare, will not flare, than if there is still a power Doppler 2 and still the grayscale. But at the same time, I'm, I'm, I'm warning or um, just a cautious note that many patients won't completely lose their signals in established RA. So maybe this would ev even lead to a prolonged overtreatment and hesitation to withdraw drugs if we take imaging alone. So my recommendation and also by the EULAR based on some of the evidence is of course that you should be in clinical remission for at least half a year to a year um, and not immediately start to, uh, to reduce the therapy or stop. And you should always reduce instead of stop. Um, but the guidelines, I think the guidelines would be really timely but probably the evidence for it is still a little bit too, um, you know, diverse, I would say. I agree, absolutely. I think the recent paper, I think in ARD is that whether you, you reduce the anti-TNF first or you re reduce the DMART first, doesn't make much of a difference. And that was pretty reassuring for a country like us. Yeah, yeah, totally. okay, okay. Yeah. 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 To reduce the costly therapy first. But I think the paper recently in ARD shows that it doesn't matter either of the way, it probably helps. What's your take on that? Um, so about the sequence, um, okay. I think about uh, about the paper first or DMAT paper first. Yeah. I think, uh, I, I think that the, the recommendation is is clear, and and um, I think the study was also uh, very nicely showing what actually has been already recommended in previous editions of recommendations that you, but that was more for economic reasons. Now we have also have the scientific evidence that it's not any worse um, to, to taper the biologic first. Um, and that's um, one side of the coin. Um, the, other, the other side of the coin is that we are, you know, in a, that decision process with the patients. And our patients usually like to stop the drug that used, that not used to help help them and not the drug that they get second place and which helped them. Um, so I think it's a challenge often enough to convince patients to take away the biologic, which was actually the drug that helped them and not the methotrexate, which was the drug that failed before they got the, met the, the biologic. Yeah, that's very interesting, you know, social differences there. Uh, Dr. Manish Patel is asking, so what if a person is not in remission, but is in a prolonged low disease activity state? Is it going to increase the risk of atherosclerosis or cardiovascular disease, even though it may not have a great effect on the joint damage? In long term, do you think low disease activity is good enough? Do they behave as well as the other patients? I would say the low disease activity <clears throat> has some reason for being low and not remission. It either is uh, a patient um, uh, reported outcome or it might even be a swollen joint or acute phase. So I, th I think a low disease activity, and I gave the three scenarios where it's um, possibly uh, acceptable, um, and that's uh, really the established long standing disease where you might not be able to get in full remission or uh, patients were treated with biologics because the TNF levels are really low, uh, and patients with um, comorbidities like depression and secondary pain syndromes that get their patient-reported outcomes so high that they never get into remission. Uh, so I think um, yeah, I, if, the, if the question is, can we go, which, which are the patients where we can be confident about cardiovascular problems and long-term problems outside the joints, I think um, I would make sure a patient doesn't progress structurally on, on plain radiographs on the um, low disease activity and uh, uh, that the CRP and high CRP sensitivity CRP is normal. If the CRP is really consistently elevated, I would consider exactly for what you were mentioning, the cardiovascular risk to maybe still change therapy, although the patient might not be so bad. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Daniel. I think Apurva Kare was asking that question. Dr. Kunal is asking, in which set of patients would you like to settle for low disease activity over remission? What would be the kind of you know, patient uh, where you would say, okay, low disease activity is you know, acceptable over remission? Yeah, 
I'll, this, these patients that I just mentioned, I think uh, you have uh, realized that there is an isolated non-inflammatory pain. Make sure you find out that the patient is um, uh, not over it. If there's a disconnect between the patient between the patient and the physician global, if that's a case, usually it's less than one centimeter on the ten centimeter uh, visual analog scale. But if it's more than that, you should get suspicious. Is there other reasons um, that that may affect the patient reported outcome? And if there are other reasons, then this is a patient where I may not need to escalate DMAT therapy. I may need to start antidepressive therapy or pain medication or physiotherapy or some other stuff. But um, treat to target is of course in the widest sense, it means getting the patient uh, to a good state regardless of the underlying disease. But if you take the RA therapy look, of course, we don't change always treatments for RA and DMARTs. We may also need to do something else uh, that deals with comorbidities. And I think that's, that's uh, uh, important to consider. Uh, I think Dr. Abdul Khalik is asking, what about Vectra D? How does that stand with the remission? Yeah. Um, I must say I have a very, um, personally very strong opinion uh, about using biomarker scales um, as opposed to clinical scales. I think so far, there is no evidence clearly showing the added benefit of a multi-biomarker panel, the added benefit over clinical assessment. I think there's evidence showing that there, that this multi-biomarker panels like the Vectra are, are similarly well predicting things, um, similarly well correlated with things. But what we need to know before we spend a lot of money into biomarkers is, is it any better than our clinical exam? Is it any better than what we're doing clinically? And this added benefit, I believe is very low. And I believe it because I haven't seen data analyzing it. And that's always raising suspicion. I think you are absolutely right. I agree. I think, I think treat the patient clinically, not the labs. That's yeah. the most- yeah, I, I fully agree. I think we are also trying work in our center about figuring out any markers which can help us to de-escalate the drug. I think we are so far not very successful with any biomarkers, but the clinical predictors does well, fairly well in getting, especially as simple as subtle like neutrophil lymphocyte ratios, persisting low ESR, uh, persisting low CRP. They, they give a good add-on information rather than any fresh biomarkers actually. And, and some of the biomarkers are really good, but the problem is they're not better than the clinical markers. Yes, so I yes, think yes. I'm not saying that the biomarkers, that they're not good biomarkers like IL-6 or CRP or any other, but if they're not better than clinical exam, let's do the clinical exam. I to spend on them. Uh, <laughs> I was asking the question, how many percentage of your patients in your clinical experience go through long-standing remission? So I think that's a difficult question. And uh, part of the difficulty is, um, uh, the, 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 this, the discussion about what is remission that I took on today also. Mm. So if you really talk about very stringent like Boolean type remission, we don't follow Boolean type, we go for CDI remission. Um, I think you can be a third of the patient these days can really be, and there's another third that maybe is around the remission and a little bit in the low disease activity for some of the reasons we discussed today. And then there's one third of patients who are, you know, need permanent attention. I would say it like that, but this is not, uh, this is a, now a guess out of my own experience rather than on, on uh, a clear evalu evaluation of our data, but that would be about Rath, my- Can I ask a question? Sure. PD. Hello? Yeah. Hi, yeah. Yeah, uh, Daniel, uh, it's Alokendu. Yeah, it's a so exciting talk, a revolutionary talk because you tried to move from, from uh, the targeted radiologic re remission towards the clinical remission. So I was wondering, are you not uh, creating a, a patient's pool more towards targeted biologics instead of uh, treating more with a combination demons like that one? Uh, what is uh, your take on that? By targeting only the clinical instead of uh, looking towards the radiologic or, or biochemical or other pool. So what will be the clinical situations where treatment 
target can also be flanked through this one or will create more push patients towards more biologics rather than combination demands? Um, I'm not sure I've completely understood, but, but I think that, that the question is about, uh, is about how, how patients by our criteria are pushed to, to biologics or to combination or, and, and about the type of treatments that we should give when we fail. Yeah, yeah. About the sequence. Um, and I think um, it's a, a difficult question to answer generically across borders, I think, um, as um, now the biosimilars, and we just heard the talk, uh, a very nice talk about it. Uh, the biosimilars really have, have arrived and have changed the, the financial so, so, sort of situation. Um, I think now there is little, uh, there's little room really for arguing combination therapy of traditional DMARs over biologics. But as I said, in some countries that might be different than in others, um, it, uh, in, in, in Austria, a biologic TNF inhibitor, biosimilar TNF inhibitor right now is not much more expensive than uh, uh, than an injectable methotrexate now. Uh, so it's maybe twice, but it's considered to the old uh, pricing. It, it's really now moved to, to um, a, a reasonable price. So I think biologic should be the next step after methotrexate failure. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Daniel, for a wonderful talk. I think my, my take home lesson from this was that we still don't understand what is remission. We are all using different, you know, you know, um, you know, measuring equipments and we're looking at like different blind men looking at an elephant. And the more and more new therapies come in like tocilizumab and Tofa, they tell us that some of the instruments that we're using like DAS-28 may not be the right way to go forward. But I think clinical uh, still remains the last domain and that is what rheumatology is all about. I would like to again thank you uh, uh, for that wonderful talk. And I would now like to ask our uh, secretary, Dr. Sapan Pandya, to give, please give the closing uh, comments on this. Thank you, Dr. Rath. Uh, uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank Pfizer for today's, uh, uh, for today's symposium. Um, there were about 400 participants today, as against 500 yesterday. You, you would expect more on a Sunday, but maybe people are holidaying a little. So we, we expect that the topics and the speakers will be so good that we'll have more next time. The speakers were very good this time, but we'll have to probably modify the talks a little so that there's more interaction as well. Um, uh, thank you, Dr. Daniel. It was it was a lovely talk, very relevant to the Indian practice because uh, you know when you talk about not needing remission, every patient, even low disease acuity, or not needing biologics and uh, not needing those sophisticated biomarkers, it becomes very relevant for our country. So so thank you very much. It was a wonderful talk. Uh, the mm -hmm. other speakers as well, Dr. Um, Handa sir, Dr. Vinita, um, and uh, Dr. Damodaran for for an excellent uh, overview. Uh, the moderators, Dr. Rath, um, Dr. Chandrasekhar, for the questions, putting in the questions and just, and ending it on time. Dr. Alkindu, sir, Shinoy, for all the work. Uh, and as, as I told yesterday, we are maybe planning an Indo-UK sort of uh, symposium in between and also a fellows retreat, which we'll, we'll have monthly sessions um, uh, for the fellows. And we'll be sending emails to you for all of that. And lastly, so... Uh, before we conclude and say that the next time we meet will be on 26th and 27th of September, which will be the spondyloarthritis symposium from the IRA. There is just this one request to all of you and you can pass it on to your colleagues and also to the industry that we, we try and avoid parallel symposia during the IRA webinar at least. We've been circulating for uh, almost a month before. So if possible, try and avoid uh, parallel, at least with this particular symposium. Uh, with that, I think I'll uh, ask you all to stay safe. And if there are any suggestions, please email to me on the secretary email, which is there on the website. And please keep looking at the website for uh, for any updates. Thank you, all of you. Thank you again. Good night and stay safe. All of you. Thank you.